All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, all of you. Uh, we've got some coworkers, we've got some friends and family and special guests. Uh, we've got people on GoToWebinar, which we're also recording for uh, later distribution, and we're streaming on Facebook Live. So uh, thrilled to have so many of you join us uh, live and online. Uh, hi, Mom. <laughs> like I said, this event is being recorded. Uh, we'll have it available to send to all of our friends and acquaintances shortly after today's event. And welcome. So my name is uh, Steve Sikora. I'm producer, president, and one of the owners here at Harmonic Software Production Studios. Uh, I've been working with uh, FileMaker for a long time. Uh, I'm also a newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic. As you'll see in uh, today's talk, there's a lot of data coming out of our diabetes tech. And we're asking, how can we leverage technology to serve and enhance the human condition? Uh, what's a brain trust before we get started? So some of you may, may have gotten an invite that says uh, come to a public brain trust. So brain trust is, an, is a borrowed term. It's borrowed from uh, Ed Catmull, who's the president of Pixar. Uh, he wrote a book called Creativity, Inc. And that book really resonated with a lot of us here at uh, Harmonic, how we do our work, how we create new things. Uh, Pixar uses a, a thing called a brain trust where a lot of folks get together, uh, previous directors and current directors, and work on problems. We kind of took ownership of that ourselves, and uh, we've turned it into something of a tradition. We meet most Fridays at 11 a.m., and uh, we discuss technical hurdles, we discuss project challenges, new ideas, things like that. Um, so this is our first public brain trust. So what's a public brain trust? Uh, our idea is once a month, we want, to, we want to invite people in, in person and online, and we want to discuss topics of community interest, whether those are uh, community where our community is diabetes or community where our community is FileMaker or some other tech topic. I think we'll be varying the topics as we go, uh, but we're excited to have you and we uh, welcome your participation as we go forward. Uh, we'll be announcing these things on social media and other channels. And if you uh, want to make sure you get on an invite list, info at harmonicdata.com, we'll get you there. So who's Harmonic? Uh, some of you work with me at Harmonic, so I'm not answering this question for you, but for folks who may not know, um, at Harmonic, we believe that software is a story. It's a technical story, it's a story of process, and a story of people and empowerment. So we decided to develop the studio model to help tell that story. So what's the studio model? It's a metaphor to help people understand the software creation process. So we think of it like a TV series. Uh, we have producers, directors, and talent, and we also have uh, pilots, episodes and seasons of our, uh, of our various series. Uh, we're also proud to be a long-term FileMaker Platinum Business Alliance member. Um, and how does that tie in? Well, announced at last week's FileMaker Developer Conference in Orlando, Florida, FileMaker Inc., who's a subsidiary of Apple, uh, they've been called FileMaker Inc. for a long time. They just rebranded to Claris International. And FileMaker, the product, continues as Claris's marquee product line. But they've now been joined by a new acquisition called Stamplay, which we're very excited about. That's going to be branded Claris Connect. And we're excited to continue uh, partnering with Claris to empower the workplace innovation platform. At heart, Harmonic and its customers are all problem solvers. Claris, with products such as FileMaker and Claris Connect, are all about problem solving. Since we have an audience that might not be completely familiar with FileMaker and Claris, I've asked Paul Mitchell, uh, my teammate, to come up and give us a few minutes, uh, giving us an overview on Claris International, what they mean by a workplace innovation platform. And I think you'll see how that plays out as we talk about diabetes and diabetes tech in a little bit here. Paul. Thank you, Steve. Grab the mic. Thank you, Steve. 
Okay, yes, as Steve mentioned, I'm Paul Mitchell. I'm a director here at Harmonic, and uh, I'm going to be showing you a little bit about the Workplace Innovation Platform. Claris International announced its new marketplace category for the FileMaker Pro Platform at the company's annual developer conference in August of 2018, the Workplace Innovation Platform. Now, defining this category is a strategic commitment to make the best platform we can and to accurately address the marketplace. Claris, of course, is a wholly owned subsidiary of Apple, and as you know, Apple has a proven history of successfully defining marketplace categories. Anybody here know what a smartphone <laughs> is? Okay. So, as a company, we know the importance of category. But first, why do we care about this right now? Over the course of the 20 year history of FileMaker Incorporated, now Claris, there's been a consistent vision for FileMaker to make powerful technologies accessible to everyone. Now what defines powerful technologies over that timeline has certainly changed. From the origin of the platform, when we were concerned about getting cross-platform, providing a real relational development environment for workstations, to more modern era, where we've been focused on mobile technologies. Now you can put your apps in the cloud. We have RESTful APIs for integrating with the Internet of Things, and much more. The technologies we've been playing with have changed, but the core vision has not. We're at a moment in time where it's important to crisply understand who we are and what we're for. Now, why is that? Oh, my slides are not advancing. <laughs> I think it's maybe one. Try now. <laughs> try click. Okay, all right. So there's some key market drivers. For starters, there's a new and dynamic nature in the workplace that's fundamentally changed how, where, and when we work. Additionally, there's a powerful mobility wave in technology that's happened over the last 10 to 15 years and it's continuing to happen. And with that has come a gap in the available skills to provide software for smart mobile devices globally. Let's take a closer look at these market drivers, starting with the dynamic workplace. This is a photo from a non-governmental organization, YWAM, Youth with a Mission. They provide medical services around the globe. Now what we see in this image is a patient intake facility at a stand-up hospital in a hut in a village in a jungle on the coast of Papua New Guinea. The process is being automated in an environment where there's limited electricity and no internet access whatsoever. The promise of technology for them is important and has done amazing things. For instance, the woman in the background can identify patients by image even though she can't speak their language and probably can't pronounce their names. This allows her to get the right patient to the right doctor for the right diagnosis and treatment. Of course, there are further advantages to this technology that we can all understand, like the ability to track patients over time. In the foreground, there's Marty Thomason of FBA Platinum partner Gearbox. He's doing real-time development on their patient management system right there in the hut. Technology like this has the reach through mobility to empower YWAM to deliver better services more efficiently despite the lack of infrastructure. This goes directly to the changing and dynamic nature of today's mobile workplace. Now moving on to that mobility and skills gap I mentioned, the growth of mobility in terms of the population of smart mobile devices has been amazing and dramatic. Over the last 10 to 15 years on this graph leading up to 2015, smart mobile devices have achieved a population that exceeds half the adult population of the entire Earth. It also exceeds twice the number of workstations and PCs in existence. We've also layered over it this orange line that shows the growth in computer science graduates in the U.S. over that same time frame. Mm -hmm. The growth in that curve has been relatively minimal. <laughs> There's actually a 40% growth in that number during that time frame, but relative to the explosion in available mobile devices, it just hasn't kept up. There's a real skills gap. There's simply more work than there are developers to do the work. That goes to an opportunity and a challenge that's in front of us in the marketplace, and we certainly see it right here at Harmonic. We hear this anecdotally from developers and partners all the time when we're work who are working at full capacity. There's a key challenge in finding new talent to answer the skills gap. So due to these drivers, there's a lot of energy in our marketplace. There's a lot of new investment from new companies trying to build software platforms that help developers solve for the skills gap. Analysts and press have been trying to define categories to make sense of the market. 
We've heard FileMaker positioned as low code or no code or high productivity from Gartner or rapid application development. These are all categories focused on efficiency of technician developers in trying to ad address the skills gap. But all these acronyms, all these names are confusing to our customers and in many cases dissatisfying. No code and low code imply by their names that code is bad. We hear that dissatisfaction from our customers. In a roundtable briefing of our FileMaker customers in Enterprise IT a few months ago, Peter Cross, who's the IT program manager from Valard, was discussing their very robust portfolio of apps and finished by saying, I wouldn't exactly call this low code. And we can say the same thing about things we've built here at Harmonic, like for customers like uh, Lockheed Martin and Apple, just not really low code. Similarly, we have new developers coming to our pro platform through programs like 42U, which is a tuition-free coding university. And those young developers are telling us that they don't want to be no or low code. They're trying to build a portfolio and resume that shows them as pro code, professional developers. They flat out reject these categories. These categories are confusing, they aren't complete, and they aren't always compelling. We believe that our category is workplace innovation platform. A workplace innovation platform accurately and completely describes what FileMaker is for today. It's also durable and forward-looking. To define a category, it's important to understand who is our core customer and what is their problem. Now, defining who the customer is for FileMaker and Claris is a difficult challenge. Our customers come from every industry, every possible business size. They have every level of technical acumen, and they're everywhere in the world. So we tend to think of our customer then as a collection of, of virtues. Our customer is smart and impatient. Given a problem, she'll find a solution. If she can't find it, she'll make it. Our customer is a problem solver. So how do we connect with a new problem solver and help her to understand that a workplace innovation platform will be useful to her? Well, with stories based on themes we hear from customers every day, like some of the stories we're gonna to hear today here. We have a point of view. It starts with the changing workplace and the promise of technology. Smart, dynamic, new technologies help you grow, innovate, and get work done. Digital transformation is separating winners from losers and providing new standards of performance for your business. This is the promise. But. The reality can be very different. As you push your business forward, why does it feel like Things are getting harder than before, harder than they should be. You look around at paper stacked up on your desk, post-its on your walls, and emails in your inbox you can never catch up with, and you get the sinking feeling that you're falling behind. Why is that? Maybe the technologies you have in your business have reached their limit. Maybe you're surrounded by appliance apps. They do important things. You're your accounting, messaging, file sharing, but they're not driving your business forward. They're kind of like your coffee machine, a critical part of your workday, but not a tool for growth and innovation. Appliance apps can only take you so far. Problem solvers everywhere have the same problem. Now Steve's gonna come back and he's gonna talk to us a little bit more about some appliance apps that he's working with. Thanks, Paul. Let's have some fun. Sure. You're going to play, right? <laughs> All right. The Blood Sugar Challenge. Today we have three contestants. You've already met me, Steve Sikora. I'd like to introduce Mary Roberts and Randy Crowley. Mary's age 21, she was diagnosed type 1 at age 12. Uh, like many children, uh, she had a diagnosis under duress. Um, she's since gotten that under control. She's now a junior in college studying nutritional science. Uh, she has lots of experience with that personally. Uh, she started with a fixed carb diet. She then moved to a carb ratio diet pretty common for uh, juveniles uh, working through diabetes. And of course, she's been at this now for a number of years, uh, longer than Randy has, longer than I have. 
she started using an insulin pump pretty recently in December of 2018. She uses a, an Omnipod pump. Uh, I happen to use the same pump. And uh, Mary described her biggest challenge as counting carbs accurately, of course. We can count them, but can we count them accurately? <laughs> Robert Crowley, age 17, uh, diagnosed type 1 at age 12 as well. Uh, Randy's mom, Daisy, right over here, gave a presentation last week at the FileMaker Developer Conference explaining the uh, story about how that happens. Very dramatic. Uh, we put big old numbers 1024 uh, on an ambulance uh, in the slide because that's what the, that's what the number turned out to be when we finally got the, the, the labs back. Uh, after he was uh, released. Randy's a senior in high school. He's a competitive soccer player. He's auditioning colleges right now. Uh, Randy's been pumping insulin from as soon as they would let him because his aunt uh, used an insulin pump. So he was familiar with the technology and he wanted to start that way right away. Uh, Randy describes his biggest challenge as time and planning commitments. So the, basically the things that uh, being a diabetic and being insulin dependent require you to take care of uh, refilling your insulin, uh, making sure it, it all, all the tech's working, counting those carbs, uh, re re dealing with problems that happen over time, etc. And a little bit more about me, I'm age 46. I was di diagnosed type 1 earlier this year at age 46. Uh, I'm a father, a husband, uh, a software professional and most, well, I shouldn't say most importantly, I'll get in trouble there. Most importantly <laughs> was this bullet. Second most importantly, <laughs> I love to uh, DIY. I love, I love building things. Uh, I think the cool kids call it being a maker these days. Uh, that's kind of my thing. So I was initially diagnosed as a type 2 because I'm 46. Uh, and, and then everyone told me, you don't look like a diabetic. Uh, so they ran blood tests, of course, and it turns out that I'm actually type 1. Uh, I have uh, autoimmune condition, which is what type 1 is, attacking my pancreas and eliminating my ability to produce insulin. So I went from a nightly insulin routine, well, actually from type 2 drugs to a nightly insulin routine to a basal bolus routine. And I just started using a pump in June, and I started looping in July, and we'll get to what that means a little bit later. So we've got a game here. Uh, the Blood Sugar Challenge is the name of a game that we've created to all play together and uh, get to know a little bit more about diabetes and about our contestants. Uh, we're going to be using our workplace innovation platforms. This game was built yesterday by me using FileMaker. Um, the audience are going to answer questions using their iPads and iPhones. Uh, correct answers will net the audience member and the correlating contestant one point, incorrect answers are going to subtract one point from the audi audience member and the correlating contestant. So you're playing for us. We're actually not playing. We're just, uh, we're the pawns in the game. Uh, Chris Sikora, uh, our intern, uh, my son, and uh, harmonic videographer is going to help us with this game. So give us a second while we get it set up. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm here to present the game. So when he says he built the game yesterday, that's true. It is just barely not an exaggeration to say that this is, this is going to be a surprise for everybody. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's buckle in. Let's play the game. We've got Mary, Randy, and Steve here. You can see Mary is associated with A, Randy's associated with B, and Steve is associated with C. So if A is the right answer and you all answer A, Mary gets points, and if A is the wrong answer, you all answer A. Mary loses a lot of points because you all clicked A. So, you know, they're playing and you're playing. We've got two games going on at once. So, question one, there are three main types of diabetes, type one, type two, and which one of the following? Now, if I click this, you should all be able to select <laughs> answers. You should have a relatively limited amount of time, somewhere in the neighborhood of three seconds. And I see we've got some answers coming in. And so the right answer was gestational diabetes, which 11 of you got right, and two of you, absolute fools, just got wrong. <laughs> I mean, I, congenital diabetes. Now, I, 
Yeah, I, I will say that yesterday when we were doing the brief test, I had never heard of gestational diabetes. And I was told it's because I've never had a pregnant wife, apparently. I don't know how that, how that figures into this. But this is also referred to as gestational diabetes mellitus, or mellitus, mellitus, OK, or GDM. Gestational diabetes occurs when a woman develops a resistance to insulin and subsequent high blood glucose during pregnancy. So. 11 of you got that one. Question number two is, which contestant first answered pizza when suggesting the hardest to calculate food? Take a good hard look at them, see who looks like a pizza person, Mary, Randy, or Steve. You have got 10 seconds. Oh, it's looking like it's trending toward Randy right now. Randy looking like, like a pizza person. Four, four for, five for Mary, one for Steve. The right answer was, was Randy. <laughs> Dead rights. <laughs> you, all, you, all, you all got him. Randy answered pizza. Steve agreed, but he was not the first to suggest pizza. And Mary answered a non-self-prepared casserole, which is essentially just pizza. Um, <laughs> foods with a large combination of ingredients can be hard to estimate. Pizza is difficult given the combination of high carbohydrate and high fat content whenever we go out to get pizza. I, Dad, well, he used to have like these needle things stab in your stomach. I can't stand the side of it. It's terrible. And you, you like adjust kind of, it's like the number of units you need, right? So it's like, well, I need five units for this muffin. But with the pizza, it's just like, you know, turn it all the way up, max settings. Here we go, hyperdrive mode. Question three, the contestants use three different carb to insulin ratios, six to one, seven to one, and eight to one. Which contestant uses the lowest carb to insulin ratio of six to one, Mary, Randy, or Steve. You have about 10 seconds. Everybody's, everybody's guessing Mary. Lowest carb to insulin, insulin ratio of six to one. We're all guessing Mary. Let's see, only two people have gone for Randy, two people have gone for Steve. And the right answer was Mary. Most of you are oh, very you smart people. Oh, you leapt ahead. Yeah, yeah. 18 <laughs> points, wow. Mary uses six to one for breakfast and lunch calculations. She does use a ratio of eight to one for dinner. Randy uses eight to one. And Steve uses seven to one for his calculation. And fun fact, if diabetes facts can be in fact fun, a lower carb to insulin ratio means injecting more insulin per gram of carbohydrate. Lower ratio, more insulin. Wrap your head around that. Oh. Question four, which of these countries has the highest prevalence of diabetes? I got this one horribly wrong, so I hope some of you do too. <laughs> Ecuador, Malaysia, or Brazil? Lots of, lots of, lots of Brazils. I won't say which one I guessed for until after the counter. I also guessed Brazil. We are all idiots together. <laughs> Malaysia is the correct answer. Malaysia. Only three people got that one right, and Steve was just wiped out. Negative 14. <laughs> there, there's an enormous delta between Steve and Mary right now. <laughs> According to the World Health Organization, or WHO, not the band, the largest numbers of people with diabetes were estimated for the Southeast Asia and Western Pacific regions, accounting for half the diabetes in the world, which is kind of astounding. Malaysia's national diabetes prevalence is currently 16 0.6%, which is incredibly high. When asked what was their primary trouble food causing hard to manage high blood sugar levels, this contestant answered pasta. Mary, Randy, or Steve. Again, good hard look. Who looks like a pasta person here? <laughs> pasta people. Does anybody have Italian heritage on the, on the guest list? A lot of people guessing Steve. Only one Randy. Uh, oh, 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 Steve. Wow. Okay, so one person got. Now don't just guess me to make it go <laughs> minus. <laughs> yeah, you guys are really. The, the ship is sinking. <laughs> Holy cow. Randy, one person guessed right. Who guessed right? Who was that? Wow, Jeff. Jeff the master. Wow. So Randy answered pasta. Randy is currently a high school senior and plans to attend college next year where he can eat lots of ramen, since he enjoys calculating for it so much. Mary's answer was quick breads, and Steve's answer was white rice. 
So moving on to question six of 12. The first closed loop for artificial pancreas system was first approved by the FDA in what year? Hasn't happened yet, 2018 or 2016. Now, I don't know who among you here keeps up with the, the hot closed, closed loop news, but it is, <laughs> it is, uh, it is a, busy, a busy field, lots of articles regularly written. And the correct answer is 2016, which slightly more than, well, actually about half of you got right. So we've, we've slightly redeemed Steve here, <laughs> only at negative 17. Yeah, in 2016, the FDA approved the first closed loop insulin delivery system called the Minimed 670G system. The term diabetes is how old? 1500 BC, 100 AD, or 1500 AD? Mm. Lots of people going for 1500 AD. 100 AD is now, we're, we're, we're kind of split between 100 and 1500 AD. Let's see. The correct answer is 100 AD. The Greek physician, so sorry, Steve. Ar Ar Artius. <laughs> I, I know, you're back at negative 24. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna give three different pronunciations, and in post we're gonna choose the one which is closest. So first, Arteus of Cappadicia, Arateus of Cappadicia, Arteus of Cappadicia. Who knows? <laughs> Eighty-one to one thirty-three A.D. He was credited with coining the term diabetes, meaning flowing through in Greek, and he described a disease with symptoms of constant thirst, excessive urination, and weight loss, which also sounds like a lot of other diseases. Uh, as of 2015, according to estimates from the International Diabetes Federation, how many people worldwide were living with diabetes? I have to say, when I first saw this one, I did not think it was any of these numbers. So it's, uh, it's astounding any way it goes. <laughs> lots, of, lots of Bs and Cs. Ooh, we're all, we're all sp it, splitting it. the midpoint. Let's see. Yeah! 387 million people. So this is in 2015. They suggested that 8.3% of adults worldwide, almost 10%, have diabetes, with nearly half of those undiagnosed, which is incredibly problematic. The total number is expected to surpass 592 billion, or C, in less than 25 years. Uh, and as of 2018, three years later, around 422 million people are living with diabetes nearly doubling the prevalence from 4.7% in 1980. So since 1980, nearly doubled the prevalence of diabetes. In the United States alone, it's around 29.1 million adults and children. Which contestant answered that they prefer to use primarily paper-based, or books and charts, sources for their carbohydrate calculations? Mary, Randy, or Steve? paper-based, ancient technology here, <laughs> ancient technology. I would just go all the way to the wax tablet if I was going to use paper-based products for my, my carbohydrate calculations. Yeah, yeah. The answer is Mary, which almost all of you got right. She uses a calorie king, choose your foods, food labels. These all sound like kind of children's food coloring books, I think. Um, the primary source of carb information, Mary's currently attending college studying dietary science. Randy and Steve primarily use apps or look up stats online, which was the right answer to the question. <laughs> the first blood sugar meter was developed when? In 1961, 1966, or 1969? I will point out to anyone online that I do not believe that these years actually ever existed, so <laughs> you don't have to vote if you don't, you don't, you don't feel like they were real. This is pre my parents supposedly having been born. In 1969, that's the right answer. So five of us got that right. Even still, Steve is at a woeful negative 24. Uh, the first portable blood glucose meter was created by Ames Diagnostics. It was called the Ames Reflectance Meter, or ARM. Ames later became a part of Bayer. The device looked a lot like the tricorder devices used in the original Star Trek series. It cost about $650, which in 1969 was like two cars, and they were only for doctors <laughs> to use in their practices or hospitals. Portable blood glucose meters for home use by patients were not sold in the U.S. until the 1980s. How many people died from diabetes in 2014? This is a, a fun question mark fact. <laughs> Most of us are splitting the difference. Eight, eight of us are going for B. Some of us are going for the low number. And the right answer is, unfortunately, the high number, 4.9 million people. 
Uh, that's the estimate for 2014, meaning every seven seconds a person dies from diabetes, mm -hmm. which is crazy. But at least Mary and Randy are catching up with Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which of the following are not potential health complications from diabetes? Hair loss, hearing impairment, or eye damage? Lots of, lots of votes for hair loss. We've got some for hearing impairment. Nobody's going for C, though. Let's see. Hair loss is the, yes, hair loss is the right answer. Leaving Mary with 19 points, Randy with six, and Steve with negative 21. So <laughs> depending on if we're using golf rules or not, I don't, really, I don't really know how that factors. Diabetes increases the risk of many serious health problems, including kidney disease, eye damage, and hearing impairment. Additional complications include cardiovascul cardiovascular disease, nerve damage, pregnancy complications, skin conditions, and foot problems but thank goodness not hair loss on top of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, that is the game. Give yourselves all, all right. applause. Oh, and I should say, thank you. Lynette Sikora won with 10. Wow, good job. Thanks. I would not have called that. <laughs> it's like I live with so many diabetics. Oh, that's true. All right, I'm still broadcasting, Fred. You, we are, whoops, there we go. You are still broadcasting. All right. Well, thank you all for playing the game. Whoop, we already did that. <laughs> all right, so now I want to just provide a little bit more detail on diabetes in general and more specifically some of the tech used by the three of us. So just as a primer, uh, A, caveat. Have a seat. Okay, let me chair. Welcome. Uh, I am not a doctor. Uh, there is way more information than we have time and detail for here. But uh, just a few kind of key outlining points. There's three major types, type 1, type 2, as we found out in the game, gestational. Type 1 is an autoimmune disease. It attacks the pancreas and causes it to stop creating insulin. Type 2 is primarily referred to as insulin resistance as the body creates insulin resistance for a variety of uh, controversially uh, disagreed upon reasons over time as people get older. Uh, gestational diabetes, similar to type 2 in that it is insulin resistance, but it tends to clear after pregnancy. And diet and exercise matter and have an effect for all types, but it plays in different ways. Uh, exercise, for instance, helps create insulin sensitivity, which is important for all of us as diabetics, whether we're type 1 or type 2, because if we're type 1, that means we have to take less insulin. What tools do we have? So there's a lot of tools out there. Um, first and foremost, drugs and hormones. Uh, there's insulin sensitizers. There's these cool things lately called GLP-1 an an agonists. Sorry, GLP-1 agonists. Um, we have charts and logs. So for years and years and years, at least for the majority of the 20th century, anyone who was diabetic, one of the most important things was writing down. When did you dose? What was your blood sugar? Keeping track of it so you could figure out what was happening over time. Uh, we have insulin. All type 1s uh, are insulin dependent, and insulin is often used with type 2 diabetics as well uh, to help manage blood sugar. We have blood sugar meters, which started out very expensive, as we heard, back in 1969 and were not generally available. But since the 80s have been available to the public, and they're now really inexpensive and readily available. The, the main cost with blood sugar meters is the supply, the little strips, and if you're poking your finger you know, five, six, seven, eight times a day, that can certainly add up. Um, we also have constant glucose meters, which are these super cool things that are pretty new in the technology world that help tell us in real time or near real time what the blood sugar is. And we have insulin pumps. Insulin pumps are the kind of the most modern version of dosing for insulin. So it's almost like we had a little syringe of insulin and every five minutes we gave ourselves just the right amount. Of course, that's the trick is whether it's just the right amount or not. So now that we have some background on FileMaker, diabetes, and our special guests, uh, I want to basically talk through our technology stack uh, that, that each of us use. And I, I don't want to be misunderstood here as any of this as complaining. 
Um, I'm, like I said, I'm just 46. I'm brand new to this. And we're the recipients of amazing advances in medical and pharmaceutical science, uh, as well as some really cool, uh, what I would call in my industry, Internet of Things technologies. So Internet of Things, uh, what, that, what that IoT, what that means is, is uh, things that talk to the Internet. So it's kind of just a general term. We have washing machines now that talk to the Internet. All kinds of things talk to the Internet. But there's a lot of medical devices now. So there's kind of a subset called uh, IOMT, uh, Internet of Medical Things, that also talk to the internet. Things like our constant glucose sensors and so forth. So uh, technology continues to miniaturize. Sensors become more and more commoditized and easy to use. So there's a lot more of this stuff coming. So first of all, let's take a look here at Mary's kit. Starts with a phone. And Mary uses a constant glucose monitor by a company called Dexcom. Dexcom is a very popular uh, constant glucose monitor brand. Um, I, I didn't ask you, is it a G6? Yes. Yeah, G6. G6. So you'll see here in a moment, Mary, Randy, and I all have a Dexcom G6 uh, CGM. And, uh, and I should have pointed out, Mary's Dexcom uh, talks to uh, a variety of devices, uh, but a phone device over Bluetooth. In doing so, it can also talk to HealthKit. So HealthKit is Apple's uh, database on, the, uh, on an iPhone or iOS device that's capable of recording health information from other applications. And here it is pushing data into Del HealthKit. Mary also certainly has a glucose meter, though, because we need to make sure that that CGM is as accurate, is registering uh, correctly. So we often will uh, uh, calibrate our CGM with a glucose meter, and that's our backup. Anytime a number looks funky or the tech stops working, uh, get out the glucose meter and, and check. And so that data might be driven in uh, to a phone. Mary has an Omnipod insulin pump. An Omnipod's kind of an interesting take on an insulin pump. It is a disposable all-in-one device. So you attach it to yourself and it includes the pump, uh, radio, a little tiny computer, uh, the insulin reservoir, and then three days later you rip that thing off and you put a new one on. The Omnipod does not talk to the phone. The Omnipod talks to a device called a PDM, which stands for Personal Diabetes Manager. Now this is their old version. They have a new version that does can talk to the phone via Bluetooth, uh, but Mary is using the old version, so she has a separate device, her PDM, and that's where she's going to put in the carbs, uh, any adjustments that she and her endocrinologist would make to her therapy for that carb ratio or insulin sensitivity. That's all going to be in the PDM, and the PDM is a little computer that helps calculate how much insulin should be given based on the input provided. So that's Mary's tech. And we can see she's got, you know, maybe three apps, uh, <coughs> several devices, and uh, she doesn't want to lose any of these because that's all key to her well-being. Let's talk about Randy's kit now. Randy's got that uh, soccer ball. That's his first piece of kit. <laughs> then uh, Randy has a phone. Randy also has a Dexcom CGM. Uh, which talks to his Dexcom app on his phone. Uh, that drives data into HealthKit. And, of course, we have the activity monitor as well. So on Randy's phone, uh, he also has activity, keeping track of how much did you walk, and so on and so forth. Randy has a glucose meter, same reason as before. Randy has an Apple Watch, so the Apple Watch can do fun things like uh, give you a remote display of what your blood sugar is from the Dexcom and information primarily driven to the Apple Watch in Randy's case. Randy uses a different kind of a pump. It's, called, it's made by a company called Tandem. It's called a T-Slim X2. It has its own brains and it has its own screen and control system. And something cool about the Tandem T-Slim is that the Dexcom is capable of talking to that Tandem insulin pump and doing some interesting things. Whoops, sorry, let me go back there before I move to Steve. One more, Bill, right there. Doing some interesting things like, in the middle of the night, if the CGM reading is going down, the tandem uh, insulin pump is capable of stopping or suspending insulin delivery so that Randy doesn't go into a hypoglycemic state 
while he's trying to sleep, which is mainly a benefit for mom, but also a benefit for Randy. <laughs> So my kit, and this is my current kit, of course, as you heard, I've been through a rapidly evolving set of kit. I, of course, have an iPhone. This is like my 18th iPhone. <laughs> um, I have a Dexcom CGM, and it talks to HealthKit and to the phone. I have my activities and uh, other information on my iPhone. I, for instance, I have a scale that I get on every day, and it pushes in my weight, my percentage body fat, et cetera, <clears throat> into my phone as well. I have a glucose meter I use for uh, calibrations. I have that same Omnipod insulin pump, but instead of talking to the insulin pump with a PDM, I have a different thing. I have a, what's called a Riley link, and my Riley link is right here. And I'm going to need my phone back, by the way, to do a demo in just a second. So this Riley link is a device that's, uh, that I bought uh, on the open market. It is a, think of it as a wireless translator later. So it talks Bluetooth to my phone and it talks the proprietary wireless signal to the Omnipod that, that uh, the Omnipod Corporation had programmed in. I do that because I have downloaded from the Shareware DIY community a LoopKit app and I've built the Loop app. And what the Loop app is, is it's an application that talks to the pump, talks to the CGM, uh, it interacts with HealthKit, and it interacts with my Apple Watch to let me control my particular dosing and uh, diabetes management. So let's talk about that in a second, for a second. Uh, and I think the easiest way to do it is via demo. So I'm gonna jump up here again and switch a couple of things. Yeah, inception there. <laughs> All right. So we're going to screen mirror. And this is my phone. I don't think I left anything embarrassing on it, so we'll, <laughs> we'll see. So I think mom's trying to message me, though. All right, so this is the Loop app, and this is live in real time. This is me right now. So. What is, what is going on here is a handful of things. The top graph that we see there is the dots on the left. That's my actual blood glucose trends while this has been going on, a little elevated you know, due to uh, nervous energy and whatnot. And the dotted line is the app predicting what's gonna happen to it over time. The, the second group down is the current active insulin in my bloodstream based on what the app has been providing and based on my dosage for breakfast, which I ate right before I drove into the office today. Uh, you can see here the insulin delivery being adjusted up and down by the app and the remaining active carbohydrates uh, from the app. So what's, what's different with the Loop app is it is the, it is the DIY community's effort to get to a closed loop system before FDA valid effort, validated efforts are available. So basically this app is a, is a stack of shareware code that we downloaded, we put on a computer, we had to have an Apple developer account, we compiled it, it goes on one phone, it only exists on my phone, and you know anyone else who wanted to compile it, it would only exist on their phone, and it runs on my phone. Now it's, it's buyer beware, right? It's your mileage may vary because there's no company out there that is standing behind this. There is no agency that has tested it for efficacy and so forth. I'm taking my own health into my own hands. But remember I said, I really love DIY, right? So this very much appeals to my sense of how the world should work. There's some interesting things going on here though that, that are interesting kind of evolutions of what we see happening with Mary's Tech and Randy's Tech. To start with, we do have many of the same sorts of settings, right? I could go in here and I could look at what my base insulin settings are. And in the regular pumps, we set very similar things. Um, there are also 
uh, the notion that Randy's pump is suspending insulin when it gets too low, that's kind of like half of what the loop concept is doing here, where yes, it will suspend insulin if it's looking to be too low, and some of these lines down are the system suspending insulin for short term, but it will also increase the insulin rate if the insulin, uh, if, if my blood sugar is trending too high and it appears that I'm going to go hyperglycemic instead of hypoglycemic. That's where this line, this prediction line comes in and that's, it's a complicated thing because I'm gonna draw on the whiteboard here for a second. Insulin doesn't actually work in a simple kind of binary fashion, unsurprisingly, right? Because it's a hormone and things like hormones never are binary. So if this were zero hours and this were six hours, the way injected insulin works is it, it kind of looks like this, right? Where this line here is about one hour in. So that means that first of all, we can't take, inject insulin and expect it to start working immediately. That's a bit of a challenge that we have versus folks who uh, have normal human insulin working effectively. Um, it also means though it has a long tail and this is, this is fast acting insulin. This is not long acting uh, nighttime insulin. So what'll tend to happen, at least with me and I would imagine other people, is I'll eat something and I'll think I'll calculate correctly and then I'll look and all of a sudden my blood sugar is like 195 and I'm like, oh my goodness, what in the world? I need to take more insulin, right? Well, that may or may not be true because the problem is where am I at in this cycle, right? Did I, did I take the insulin too late? Did I not take enough? It's hard to know what might be going on. So we really have to take into account what this looks like because if we add more insulin, you know, what's that gonna do? Or where is it in the cycle, right? It could be several hours later, but there's still some insulin in my system uh, going on. Now, a standard pump really uh, has some relatively binary ways of keeping track of that. And it does try to keep track of that. It's a, it's a, it's a value called insulin on board. Um, this system does an interesting thing though. It actually uses a very uh, sophisticated predictive algorithm that follows the curve of the insulin. They've got a model from several different uh, types of insulin. And it, it predicts all the way out to six hours. Most of our pumps, we just set up a three hour window. And after those three hours, it assumes there's no more insulin. So there's a, a fairly sophisticated predictive algorithm at work here. So this is all really cool. And you know, at one level, you'd think problem solved. Now, the, the issue is, what happens if I lose this, right? Or what happens if I lose this? Or what happens if any of it stops working? Um, there's, there's, yeah. Uh, it, it did go in the washing machine once and thankfully we caught it fast enough. <laughs> so there's, there's still a variety of challenges and, and I am looking forward to improvements in the physical tech. But what I really want to talk about today is actually not necessarily improvements in the physical tech. One more thing before we, before we end the demo here. This is <clears throat> an organization by the name of Tidepool. Tidepool is a nonprofit that uh, it is basically a software company uh, working on a diabetes solutions. So this is my actual tide pool data. You can see down here at the bottom, uh, insulin above and below the, uh, the normal rate, right? If I was on a pump, it would just be following that dotted line. So the fact that it's adding and pulling insulin uh, is the, the little mountains going up and down. You can see here where I've specifically told it, hey, I'm eating this much you know, deliver me insulin there, and then you can see the corresponding blood sugar graph. And that was, let's see, that was for yesterday. Let's see how we're doing today. Yeah, not too bad. Now, if we go back and look at last week, where there were, where I was at a developers conference, um, let's see if we can find the day of craziness. Right there, there we go, Tuesday. So what in the world was going on here, right? Uh, my, my blood sugar is never that high and, and you know beware if you're if you don't know kind of everybody's blood sugar game is different right um, uh, so where my numbers are at versus someone else is not the point but for me this is significantly higher than I would expect so what was going on because I kept like more 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 
I kept adding insulin and it just wasn't working. Well, I finally, finally went and I, I, I closed down the pot early and I pulled it off and I looked and the cannula was kinked. So I was getting some percentage of the insulin that I was actually trying to dose. Who knows what percentage, you know, 50%, 30%, I have no idea. <clears throat> so let's switch back here for a second. Um, I want to ask Paul back up here for a little bit and talk about appliance apps and work rep because that's really the core of the issue that I, that I want to discuss here with, um, with where we go with this. Thanks, Steve and Chris. That was an amazing game, wasn't it? Yeah. I just want to point out that number that we talked about, how many people in the world have diabetes that exceeded the population of the United States. I was, I was astounded when I saw that. Um, so I talked about appliance apps, and now Steve has just demonstrated some appliance apps for you. And so FileMaker calls the scourge of appliance apps the work rut. And the work rut is a problem that businesses and everyday problem solvers encounter when they exhaust or outgrow the capabilities of their appliance apps or their existing processes and progress just stalls. You know you're experiencing the work rut when your people are on a treadmill and doing the same thing over and over again. Your cash flow is steady but not on the trajectory you want. You're wasting time every day looking for a current version document buried in your email or your cloud storage or a chat channel. We'll make this work. Some other signals that we continue to hear from our customers and that indicate you might be in the work run are scattered information. The spending too much time searching for decentralized documents and data, not being assured that they're even accurate. Broken or ad hoc processes, being stuck on a treadmill, doing the same mundane tasks repeatedly, or rigid technology preventing you from getting apps where you need them on the devices that you have. These are symptoms of the work rut and challenges that businesses and individuals relate to and struggle with every day. So how do you get out of the work rut? Your appliance apps, they do what they do. But they're just not made for addressing the unique needs of your business or your situation. Maybe you've researched enterprise systems like ERP or CRM from huge companies, but hiring a global systems integrator puts the price tag way out of reach for a small business that doesn't even have IT. And in the enterprise, customizing those systems is equally out of reach with six to seven figure cost estimates that you frequently just don't have budget for. You end up setting up data dumps to feed your appliance apps and you're just digging deeper into your work run. You know you need technology that's made for you and probably needs to be made by you. Because you're a problem solver, you figure it out. Problem solvers can be anyone. Whether you are a knowledge worker in your field with limited programming skills or a professional software developer, let's focus on the problem solver for a moment. As a problem solver, we recognize the challenge to innovate can be daunting. You start with questions like, how? Can you make it yourself? Can you get help? How long will it take? Will it work on your devices? Can you afford it? Our customers have all these questions, but with some research, and maybe a visit to the local Apple store, or a recommendation from a client or an employee, they find the right answer. They find the right platform. They choose a workplace innovation platform. A workplace innovation platform is built to fill the gap between appliance apps and enterprise systems. A workplace innovation platform provides everything you need to solve your unique challenges yourself. You can design and create custom apps for your business. You can orchestrate and integrate your apps with software devices, enterprise systems, or even IoT devices to always lead in your marketplace. You can share your apps so your teams can be connected anywhere they're doing their work on any devices they're carrying. The best workplace innovation platform makes breakthrough technology accessible to everyone. This is our point of view story. Its themes are based on many real customer stories, so we believe it's true and accurate. In summary, we believe our category is concerned with more than just the efficiency of tools for technicians. We believe our customers are problem solvers who solve for the work rut by innovating their workplace. At FileMaker, we have decades of investment and innovation resulting in the premier workplace innovation platform. 
You can design and create custom apps for your business. You can orchestrate and in integrate your apps with software services, enterprise systems, or even IoT devices to always lead in your marketplace. You can share your apps so your teams can be connected anywhere they're doing their work on any devices they're carrying. The best workplace innovation platform makes breakthrough technology accessible to everyone. Claris International has a large, committed global expert community. Our more than one million active FileMaker Pro subscribers <coughs> and more than four million downloads of FileMaker Go show the strength of our platform. With 20 years of consistent probability, profitability with over half of our business outside the U.S., that proves the stability and scale our customers rely on. Our customers believe we are the right company with the right platform. We're deeply focused in every function of our company to make the best workplace innovation platform now and looking towards the future as we embrace new technologies. And FileMaker was named by the G2 crowd as the number one workplace innovation platform in the marketplace. Now I'm going to give you back to Steve. He's going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing to innovate. Thanks, Paul. So there's a component of all of this uh, that in my um, opinion is underserved. Those of us in the field of technology and computer sciences are quick to build solutions that can do a thing can capture data, record events, extrapolate outcomes. And I showed you some pretty cool solutions that do that stuff with diabetes tech. Uh, but I think we often forget the human element. With a chronic condition, it's not about the one-time capture. It's about the long-term repeatability of subjective and objective data capture and analysis. Without the combination of the two, it's difficult to make meaningful progress. As humans, we're much more likely to record a complaint than we are a moment of calm. I want to take a couple of minutes and tell you a story that's not about diabetes, but it relates to the very subject that I'm talking about here. Um, with a growing populace and rapidly increasing urbanization, most countries face increasing air pollution challenges. Our indoor air quality is often significantly worse than our outdoor air quality. CO2, particulate matter, and off-gassing are the constant byproducts of human habitation. Why does that matter? Well, for me, it's personal. For many years, I've watched as my wife struggles to breathe, an ability I take for granted. Lately, her breathing has gone from an occasional inconvenience to a far more frequent and unwanted reality. And as I've listened to my wife and watched her suffer, I've begun to realize that we as humans face a number of challenges when attempting to self-report our pain, our ailments, and our struggles. This can increase the difficulty of seeking help, whether it's professional, institutional, or private. Professionals want to deal with facts. They want to dispense advice and treatments that are safe, risk-managed, and peer-reviewed. But what if I don't want to live the rest of my life on your steroids? Gurus would like to enlighten our way out of the problem, which would be great, but what if I don't get it? Those who are afflicted, especially people with chronic conditions, difficult to diagnose conditions, tend to own our problems. It seems that no one understands our challenges. So in this particular subject, for me, many hours and dollars have gone into attempts at diagnosis and treatment, but answers remain elusive. We know that microbial sensitivities, pet dander, and outdoor air quality are highly correlative, but nothing we've tried really seems to help. So how can I help? How can I as a software professional help? How can I mash up the objective with the subjective? How can I present it for analysis and submit it for action? What do we have? We've got subjective input. Objective data, analysis, and action. That seems like a mobile app, a database server, a reporting and data manipulation tool, and some API integration. And that's where I go to that same platform that Paul was talking about. I also think we need some cats. Uh, introducing the cat suite here. By the way, this was a presentation that I gave in full at a FileMaker Developer Conference last week. Why cats, though? Uh, my wife, who's sitting right here, by the way, loves cats. I even think my wife may be a cat. But we can't have cats because real cats are not great for indoor air quality, especially for someone with her sensitivities. 
So I came up with this idea to build an app because I'm a database guy. I wanted to help capture and clarify through some of that subjective fog. Uh, today's a terrible day. Today's a great day, right? Uh, but I had a problem because my wife's not super fond of technology. Um, I would ask her to put something on the calendar and she picks up this book. What's that about? I ask her to turn on the lights and instead of saying, hey Siri, like any sane person would, she gets up and presses the button which she insisted that I put in. I, I wanted it to just work verbally. So how can I get her in the middle of the night when she's totally irritated that she woke up unable to breathe yet again to click a button on a screen and, so that I could capture some of the where, when, and why around the subjective experience. Right? So I knew it had to be there, I knew it had to be always on, I knew it had to be as few clicks as possible because she hates being made to feel stupid by technology, and we all do, really, when it comes down to it. And I knew it had to be beautiful, so what I didn't know is what would cause her to click the second time through the nth time, right? Because one click doesn't really tell us much. So I asked her and she said, well, this is probably silly, but is there some way after I complete the entry that you could have a nice cat curl up and go to sleep on the screen. I think that would help me calm down and get back to sleep. So I built the Happy Cat app, the part one of the cat suite. So what this is, is it's a dedicated interface. It's an old iPad Mini 2. It sits permanently on uh, her nightstand and acts as her clock and input device. It has beautiful hand-drawn art. And it's targeting the sweet spot between data capture and motivation, right? Some gamification in there. So now instead of being totally irritated that she woke up in the middle of the night, no. Nope. Yeah. Um, she's only mostly irritated because she feels like she's doing something by recording the why, when, and where, right? And she loves the cats. So let's take a look at this app real quick. This is the loading screen and uh, the main menu the time is always shown at the top. Depending on the time of day, a different default entry will be prompted. Since it was 11.42 at night when we recorded this video, the app assumes my wife can't get to sleep. So let's look at that entry. Uh, we get a fun intro image channeling the user's experience, and we're then presented a series of choices pre-selected for the user that help her quickly and efficiently provide feedback. Maybe she can't breathe, maybe it was too many cat naps, but this night, uh, it's because she's too hot. Data captured, she's presented with a reward image and thanked for her input. And now the app is ready to record the next moment. So that's my attempt at uh, trying to mash up some of that subjective and objective data input. And when I look at my particular challenges uh, around diabetes, I feel like there are some areas for improvement along the same lines. So. Let's talk real quick about where the blood sugar industry is headed. And I don't mean that term negatively or positively. There's a lot of aspects of the blood sugar industry. Um, and this is just a, a smattering of them. There are certainly many more. Um, there's new drugs and hormones being developed all the time by the pharmaceutical industry, of course. There are new therapies being developed all the time by a variety of very interested and engaged uh, scientists, uh, medical professionals, and laypeople. Um, we have closed loop artificial pancreas type technologies under development by numbers of companies worldwide, right? The fact that uh, the one system is out from Medtronic and the, the loop DIY system that I told you about uh, is just a piece of what's going on, right? There's lots of companies chasing that same type of a process. There's even uh, one company working on a dual hormone system. So insulin uh, brings down our blood sugar. There's another hormone, uh, glycogen, that raises your blood sugar. So there's one company that's working on a dual hormone system to do that. There are some biotech cures that are being worked on. And wouldn't that be cool if we could fix the thing that, stop, that keeps our body from attacking uh, ourselves in an autoimmune condition? Um, one of the things I'm most excited about, though, is interoperability and grassroots community efforts, crowdfunded type solutions. So Tidepool that I showed you about earlier has taken on the challenge of shepherding the app that I showed you, the Loop app, uh, through FDA approval and are working with a series of other device makers 
who are willing to get behind the concept of interoperability. Dexcom is one. They've agreed to an ICGM standard, right, so that their stuff will play with other people. Omnipod agreed to work with them on the pump side, and Medtronic has recently agreed to work with them as well on the pump side. So there's this notion that maybe I don't have to provide the whole solution, right? Maybe I can provide a piece of the solution because a different combination might work better for other people. Maybe your insurance coverage covers one and not the other. There's all kinds of problems and challenges that that may help resolve. So what are we doing? Why am I talking about this? Well, first of all, because I have diabetes, right? So it's a, it's a topic that is of, of relevance to me. Uh, but we're already working on this in some interesting ways. Daisy uh, presented uh, last week at the FileMaker Developer Conference an app that we've been working on that she titled One Goal for Me. So what this app does is it extracts data from the health kit, that database of data that, uh, that our devices are constantly pumping information into. It brings that data into a custom app built on FileMaker that lets us start to evaluate that data and look at extrapolating possibilities and so forth. But I feel like that's, that's a great foundation for where I want to head. I feel like we're just getting started. To me, the real blood sugar challenge looks like this. How do we capture the subjective input that we really need to evaluate what was actually going on? What was actually going on with us that day? Why were we stressed out? Why did, why did you know, I have nothing recording that my cannula was kinked, and that's why that line uh, jumped up. The challenge with that kind of subjective data entry, though, is that it's, it's tiresome. We get tired of writing things down. I can't imagine living in the day where I had to record every time I dosed on a piece of paper, right? But many, many people still do that. Many people only ever did that over the course of the last century. So how do we make the lowest possible barrier of entry in this data? How do we build something that helps us capture some of those additional subjective data points and do things with them, but does it in a way that we'll engage with, that we'll do, that we'll execute over and over and over. The Chipotle example. So here's what I mean by that. I eat Chipotle probably once a week. And like many of you, I bet when you go to a restaurant and there's something that you like at the restaurant, you tend to order the same thing. Or maybe you have a couple different things. But usually, especially if you're in a hurry, especially if it's like a lunchtime meal, you're going to order that same thing. Well, when you're a diabetic, that, that has double benefits, right? Because if you know how your body reacts to a particular meal, ordering the same thing decreases the chance that something unexpected is going to happen. The problem is I can never remember what I typed into my system the last time I went to Chipotle. So I'm standing in line and I'm like, okay, I know they've got a nutrition thing online. So, okay, I'm going to get rice and I'm going to get beans and I'm going to get chicken. Oh, wait a minute, it's not loading because the Wi-Fi is sucky here. Um, and I finally, and maybe I just guess or maybe I dose uh, th for 35 grams or 40 grams or whatever it is. I don't remember what I did the last time. I only did it a week ago. Further, I don't remember when I did it. Remember, we've got this whole time component as well. It's not just how much, but it's what time do we do it. So what if there was a way where using as little of my effort as possible, I could add some data to the stream that would help me with that, right? What if I could, for instance, when I sit down to eat, take a picture of that? And that picture would represent the moment I started eating. That does several things for us, right? That automatically, I have, a, I have a geo stamp, so I know where I was. Hey, I was at Chipotle right over there on Beltline. Um, I know the timestamp of when I started eating, which means I can calculate how long was it from when I bolused for that meal to how long was it that I started eating for that meal. Now, I have the luxury with all this tech that I showed you and talked about that my tech already recorded and pushed into HealthKit how much insulin it gave me and how much carbs I said it was giving me that insulin for. With all of our kit, we don't necessarily have that. So we probably need to think about some flexibility for if we can get that data automatically, 
all the better. Again, we're lowering that barrier of entry. But if we can't, how can we easily ask for the right data points to help predict it? Because then what I could do, and this is the data analyst side of me coming out, is I could come back later, that's automatically recording my blood glucose, right? And I could say, hey, how did that event work out for me? Where did I start? Where did I finish? What did I dose? How long did I dose before that meal? And how did it work? Was that, a, was that an A-plus experience or a, or a B-minus experience or a complete fail? And I could use that knowledge to help do the right thing the next time, right? So the next time I'm at Chipotle, it might even know that I'm at Chipotle because we have these cool things called geofences, right? And it might look up that I have a reference to being at Chipotle. Maybe I've done it four times. Maybe I know four times in a row that dosing for 35 grams 15 minutes before I start to eat is the perfect sauce, right? So that's what I mean by the Chipotle example. That's, that's one way I think we could help is, is pulling together some of these different data points and experiences. Let me talk about a more complicated one though, and it's the pizza conundrum. And I totally agree with Randy that pizza is insanely impossible to calculate for. And that is simply because you've got a lot of carbohydrate and you've got a lot of fat. And an interesting thing happens in our bodies when we add fat as we're eating carbohydrate. It dramatically delays how long the carbohydrate takes to take effect. It doesn't stop it though, it just delays it. And the same thing is true with protein, but pizza is primarily a high fat, high carbohydrate, sometimes moderate protein, depends on what you put on it, right? So in the pizza conundrum, I go to a pizza restaurant and I sit down at 6.30 and it's a lovely pizza and I, first of all, I have to guess how much I'm gonna eat, which is sometimes difficult because usually when I start eating pizza, I guessed low, <laughs> all right? Oh, it's way better than I remembered. I'm gonna eat more of that. Um, and then I, I, have to, I have to figure out how many of those carbs are and then I, I, I dose for that amount of carbs and something, something funky happens to my blood sugar, right? So if I dose for that amount of carbs and let's say, oh, let's say this line here is, is 90 and let's say my, my blood sugar is right here and then I dose for the right amount of carbs for pizza, I just leave a few minutes. That's what ends up happening typically when I, when I eat pizza and I dose for the amount of carbs in the pizza. Why is that? It's that delay effect, right? Because I've got too much insulin up front going on and it takes a while for the carbs to start to hit. Then at like three in the morning, it's like that, which is nuts. The other stuff doesn't do that, right? So what if there were a way, and this is me really dreaming, right? What if there were a way to be a little bit more sophisticated than just carbs? Because food isn't just carbs, right? And a lot of us uh, may choose to eat a low carb diet where we've got a much higher percentage of protein taking effect. Uh, for instance, um, I love for breakfast on Saturday, three eggs and a couple sausages or three strips of bacon. No carbs in that. And yet if I don't dose insulin, my blood sugar is gonna jump up. Why? Because our body will take that protein and will turn it into blood sugar. It just takes a little longer to do it. So what math do I do? Well, I guess is the answer. But what if I didn't have to guess, right? What if we were able to take a more sophisticated set of input and provide appropriate dosing measurements from it? And I don't think that that's an easy thing to do, right? But if I had a way to take that picture, maybe look up from a uh, AI system what that is, which lets me look up from an API uh, the nutritional balance of that and collect that nutritional stack together, this much carb, this much fat, this much protein, and then create a recipe for dosage from that that's maybe even not a single event. Maybe in the case of the pizza, I need to dose some here and some here and some here for what I'm eating, right? Wouldn't that be cool? But it requires that we hook together a whole bunch of things. It requires a lot of tech, obviously. Um, and it's, and it's non-trivial. But that's really where I'm interested in heading. What can we do? Because all of those technologies I just listed, they're there today. In fact, 
we came back from the developer conference. Daisy has a demo. Uh, another another f uh, set of folks did, and they're working with uh, uh, Australian government um, on uh, on recognizing pictures of food and being able to look up uh, uh, dietary uh, information from it. Right, so. Um, it's not great. Like we, we did a picture of a pork chop and it was like, well, pork or steak? Not really sure, right? And I'm looking at it, I'm going, definitely pork, right? So how do, we, how do we train the model better, right? I mean, there's, there's work to be done here, but it's not an impossible task. It's not something that's arbitrarily far into the future. So that's my blood sugar challenge to us as a company, to us as a community, is what are those next two or three steps we can take to move in this direction, to move in this direction with the fantastic advances that pharmaceutical and device manufacturers and medical professionals and scientists are making, right? We are not going to duplicate or render any of those efforts useless, but I think there's areas to contribute. There's areas where we can be collecting data and figuring out models and processes that can help add to the process and can help contribute uh, a better future world with those things on that last bullet point, right? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, our FileMaker stack, and Claris Connect, which is a way to hook up between all of this stuff. So let's, let's talk about this. And you know, we have a few minutes here today, and I'd love to talk to any of you in person. I know those of us online are probably about to sign off. Uh, but let's keep talking about it. I know for, for me at Harmonic here, this will be an ongoing effort. And uh, you know, we're trying to decide, how are we playing with this? Is it a hobby? Do we start a nonprofit and do this uh, in parallel? You know, how do we do it, right? Um, but I'd love to talk to each of you about it. I appreciate your attendance and your, uh, your attention uh, as we went through this. Hope you learned a couple things. And uh, thanks for coming.